Hello, I'm Alan Pockard, and you're listening to Call Talk Radio for October 26, 2017. Today's topic is reinventing the call center training for a better customer experience. If you are listening live, we invite you to be a part of the show and ask questions. Here's, here's how. Here's how you do it. Email me at alan at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at benchmarkportal.com at any time of the day. And now I would like to introduce our host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Okay, thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. We have all heard the expression, keep doing what you've always done, and you will get what you've always gotten. And this is certainly true of contact center training, which is a key ingredient to a well-run operation. We all know just how central, really, good training is to a well-run call center, which we all would like to have. And that's why we wanted to talk about new ways to approach the issue of reinventing call center training by exploring, exploring three critical training challenges that hamper excellent customer service. We brought on an expert on the topic for you, Connor Burt someone who is highly focused on training. Welcome to the show, Connor. Hey, thanks, Bruce. Excited to be here. Okay, great. Well, by way of introduction, Connor is the Chief Exec- chief Operations Officer. I almost gave you a uh, promotion there, Connor. <laughs> chief Operations o- Officer at Lessonly, which provides modern team learning software. He directly oversees services and client experience. And as always on the occasions when we have vendors, officers on call talk, Connor is here in his personal capacity as a contact center expert and will be focused on providing our listeners with important insights and thought leadership. Connor lives in Indianapolis with the love of his life, Lena, and a placid dog named Titan. Now, that's not the Titanic, (laughs) right? That's Titan. (laughs) That's correct. That's correct. Okay, good. And uh, by the way, we have a very chill cat here named Truffles. So maybe we should get them together, you know, Titan and Truffles, T and T. Sounds a little bit explosive, actually. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyway, we'll get on with thing. some fireworks of our own. What's that? I said alliteration is always a good thing. <laughs> but you've got to expect it from somebody whose name is Bruce Belfiore. You know, it kind of comes with the territory. <laughs> there you go. So, Connor, you know, at the end of the day, contact center training is aimed at providing excellent customer experiences to those who contact us. So tell us, in your mind, what ultimately defines a good customer experience? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, Bruce. I've, I've kind of gone back and forth on this one over the years. I think, you know, my, my old me uh, would have said, that great customer experience is one that delights the customer. Um, But what I think I've learned working with our customers and others in the space is really that good customer experience is when you make it extremely easy for the customer to get what they want, Um, which I think is different than the heroic stories we sometimes tell of customer service agents going above and beyond. But at the end of the day, I, I think really what it boils down to is how do we make it as easy as possible for somebody calling us or emailing us or, you know, interacting on live chat to ultimately remove all the obstacles we can so that they can ultimately get the answer they want and uh, predict uh, the next issue they might have so that they ultimately don't have to call in again. We're getting their issue resolved quickly uh, and, and then they're off on their merry way. Interesting. Okay, so we're sort of uh, moving from a net promoter score type of thing, you know, where you have such a great, wonderful, uh, mind-blowing customer experience to, uh, you know, what uh, is embodied in the customer effort score, which is more, how do you make it easy for me to get the thing done that I need to get done? And uh, yeah. that yeah, so, so that's, that's a think- great, uh, go ahead. No, I, I think you, I think you nailed it, and I think I think they're actually correlated, is what we've seen. You know, when when you do focus, yeah, as you said, really on the customer effort uh, score. Uh, at the end of the day, that that probably is going to make someone more likely to give you high MPS or, or CSAT scores or, or whatever the measure is you might be using. I, I do think they're correlated, but I think focusing on the the customer effort score is probably where we've seen the best customer 
support teams and, and call centers focus as of late. Okay, interesting. So the old me was more net promoter, the new me is more customer yep. effort. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of debate that goes on, and the statisticians have a field day with this stuff. And uh, we're kind of nerdy, as you know, at uh, Wonky here at Benchmark Portal. So uh, <laughs> we we get into this sort of thing. And at the end of the day, uh, if you look at customer satisfaction, you look at uh, net promoter, you look at customer effort, uh, actually – Tying any one of those in a statistical fashion on a consistent basis to customer loyalty and repurchase is a very difficult thing to do. And so it comes down to, you know, what do we feel as managers is the best way to uh, sort of point our people and uh, put our efforts in to to try to get things done. Um, Well, you know, tell me, too, about um, uh, the three challenges that prevent call centers from delivering the experience that you're talking about and why. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to try to keep it brief. I, I think there's, there's a lot of things. I think it starts Bruce with, you know, you mentioned it at the beginning of, of the show, a lot of call center leaders do believe that training is an important thing. I would say the the first problem is not giving training the level of attention that it deserves uh, in the midst of all the other things the call center leader is thinking about around hiring, around turnover, around process, around changes, around uh, market shifts, all of those things make it really hard to kind of bump training up in the queue and it's easy to get pushed down. So I'd say the the first (laughs) kind of most interesting thing that we find is call centers not necessarily giving the weight to training that it deserves. Uh, When they do, I think we typically see uh, three kind of trends uh, if you will, that stop call centers from, from delivering that experience we were talking about. I think the first is really around accessibility of the training you're providing. So the old way of doing training uh, for most call centers typically tends to be, look, something like this, where I've got X number of agents, I've got to update them on something new, or I've got to train them on something new. So I'm going to take them off the floor, out of their cubes, pull them into a a conference room, maybe 20 at a time, and then I'm going to kind of lecture them on the latest change, process update, customer objection that we keep getting. And I think what we talk a lot about here at Lessonly is there's there's definitely a need for that, uh, but we think about the correlation between, or the difference between, rather, access and mastery. So when we think about access, uh, we know that most of the time, 70% of what you learn gets lost within 30 days, uh, regardless of how you teach them on something. So without practical follow-up and repeated retrieval of the training, um, we, we think it's really hard to change behavior of an individual. And so the first kind of pillar we think about is, are you making your training accessible to come back to, whether that's a knowledge base, an LMS, or any other sort of technology can the rep as they're in between calls or as they're going about their day, go revisit that training that you just want put them through, I think is, is number one mistake we see. Number two is we don't employ. Can can we just stop there for for a second? Because that's a really good point. I mean, I think each of us just as uh, managers, as individuals, uh, whatever it happens to be things that we're involved in both at work and outside of work, oftentimes Mm -hmm. find ourselves grasping for some piece of knowledge that we know we need, but which we don't have. Uh, And, you know, how can we get that easily? What's the best way to uh, to pick that up? And what you're saying is that uh, managers need to move beyond a mindset in which they see training as something that is delivered, uh, say, in a classroom or something, to something that is not only delivered perhaps in the classroom, but also made available to people on an ongoing basis, uh, presumably electronically. Would that be a fair yeah. statement? Okay. That, that's okay, absolutely good. right. Okay, good. So, in other words, it it's not just the the training; it's also the uh, make, putting things at people's fingertips so that they can retrieve what they've learned. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Please go on to number two. Yeah, you bet. So, so number two, I think, boils down to first the most organizations' view of training. So, one thing I would say, Bruce, is we look at most teams we work with, and we start working with them. They think of training as specifically just onboarding. 
So uh, there's kind of this idea that we've got to get people up and running fast, which absolutely is crucial, uh, especially in a dynamic environment where you're dealing with turnover or you're dealing with growth. Um, but uh, what we find is training cannot stop after the first two weeks of onboarding, just because we kind of had them, <clears throat> we, we jammed a bunch of information into their heads out of the gates. Uh, we oftentimes kind of give ourselves a pat on the back and say, all right, they're trained, they're ready to go. Um, but we think that the second most important thing to, to solve some of this is making sure training is ongoing. It's, uh, it's quick to react to what's going on in the call center. So as you're evolving, new tactics, new processes, new products, um, new services. At the end of the day, you need to be agile enough to really provide training on a weekly basis, not just thinking of it as an onboarding exercise. Because even your most tenured agents or tenured call center reps, um, there's always new things they need to be knowing. So I, I think the, the second biggest mistake really boils down to quickly evolving the tactics that you see and pushing out new training, often going back to the first one that is accessible. It can be self-guided. They can do it between calls in 10 minutes. It isn't big, long efforts, right? It's, it's quick, short, micro, uh, but it ultimately is moving at the speed in which your call center needs to go. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of that combination of doing and thinking and learning uh, sort of comes together at that point. I, I think uh, I used to be a, a swim instructor, and uh, there were some uh, students who were just fantastic at doing a Australian crawl or freestyle, whatever you want to call it, on the mm -hmm. side of the pool, you know, with, with no water around them. <laughs> you put them into the water. And it was a whole different bag of beans. And I think that's an apt uh, description of what oftentimes happens with people in training and call centers is that they will uh, get an idea of of what is expected of them, but they won't really know what it feels like, you know, in the yep. water until they're thrown in the water and have to do that. And so it's at those points in time that you still need the instructor or some sort of instruction, um, you know, resource that's available at the side of the pool or, you know, on your de desktop or whatever it happens to be, uh, to be able to give you those uh, pieces of information that you need to really put the stroke together and deliver. Yeah, that, that's a great, great, great point. I think what we often advise is really thinking about a kind of a model of you learn, you practice, and then you perform. In the world of contact centers, practice is super important. We haven't really talked about, but um, you know, can you create an environment where you roll out a new workflow, you know how to you roll out a new process, you, whatever it is you're rolling out, you allow mm -hmm. the rep to go learn it. They're, you know, studying the game film if you're using the sports analogy. And then you go into an environment where you can actually practice it before you're on the phone having to perform or in an email having to perform. So I think, you know, that kind of cycle of, you learn it, you practice, and then you perform in a very cyclical nature is ultimately what's going to get the best results uh, as you think about training. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Oh, great point. And, and what about speed of information? Talk to us about speed of information because obviously uh, the speed with which things are available uh, has an impact on a lot of things, including the mind of the agent, the uh, satisfaction of the customer, that sort of thing. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think we see the, the most kind of cutting edge call centers really doing this well, where they are, you know, both filtering the information that the agents really need. So it's not just information overload, but they are responding quickly enough so that there's a confidence when the agent is on the phone. So an example of that, that, you know, I like to use maybe something like, you know, we, we call it kind of getting beyond the, the first resolution. So oftentimes mm -hmm. the customer calls in with an issue. Um, can we train our agents to actually anticipate the next issue they might have? So they might be calling in about uh, some sort of functionality or feature that they're frustrated with, or maybe it's a pricing model that they don't like. Um, can we use data to tell us that, hey, the next time that this person's going to call, they're probably going to be asking about X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and using that information to ultimately train our reps to solve not only the issue they're calling about, but the next issue that we think they're going to have 
based on the data we've seen from others calling in like them. So kind of clustering all of the customer interactions and then boiling that down to uh, quick training that can help a rep actually solve the next problem, not just the one they're on. Interesting. Okay. So basically saying that uh, we've seen this before. Uh, the customer is always unique, but the problem is not. <laughs> Therefore, yes. oftentimes we can anticipate certain things that the customer is going to come up against. Can, can you think, I hate to put you on the spot, but can you think of any uh, specific example of where having that kind of uh, approach could help out in terms of uh, customer satisfaction. Obviously, the agent feels empowered when they have uh, got that kind of information and understanding of the situation, et cetera. Do, do you have any yeah. example? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is outside of uh, outside of uh, any any lesson like clients. So this is more of an industry and example for you. But uh, I've read mm-hmm. stories um, about Bell Canada, the telecommunication tel- telco company. Excuse me, who um, you know, exactly what I'm talking about, looked at eventually the, essentially their interactions, so they called them event clusters that ultimately were happening within the, the tickets they were getting in. And, and they ultimately saw that there was a particular feature um, that was solving a lot of customer challenges. I don't know the exact feature, but they were calling in, making a complaint, and, and this particular feature, the rep would recommend that the user go and try it. But oftentimes what they didn't do was take a minute to, um, you know, explain exactly how to use it or what it did. So they said, hey, we have this great feature. It'll solve your problem. But they didn't actually teach the user how to to use it. And so what was Mm -hmm. happening from the data they saw was they'd call in, they'd suggest the feature, and then they'd call back for instructions on how to use it. And so when they resolved that and they rolled out, you know, just quick training on how to actually teach the user how to use it, um, they decrease those kind of repeat calls by about 15 to 16 percent is is an example of that that I would think of off the top of my head. I think it was about 15 percent. It could be a little off, but something close to that. That's a great. That's a great uh, example. Great. Story. By the way, uh, yeah, Bell Canada has come up with some interesting things over the years. Uh, I don't know if you recall back; they were one of the first ones to come out with a pretty successful, um, you know, bot that would talk to people. And the story mm. is told of Emily, who was the name of the the bot, and who uh, was given a background, and you know, she came from um, either Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, and you know, went to uh, Montreal and she went to, uh, you know, spent a semester in Paris. I mean, they, they, they gave her this whole persona. Anyway, awesome. this was apparently successful enough so that there was one uh, older woman who during the beta testing uh, called in, uh, interacted with um, Emily, and then a couple of days later called in, and insisting on talking to Emily because she was such a nice young girl <laughs> and had done such a good job with her question a few days ago. <laughs> so, anyway, they've they've uh, done some pretty uh, interesting and uh, and uh, you know creative things there. Well, good. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and so you know we've got the accessibility issue that you're talking about, the speed of information. Um, the uh, you know availability of training on an ongoing basis. Uh, anything else uh, that we should also uh, be talking about before we go to questions here? Yeah, I'd say the last thing, Bruce, that that we always recommend, no matter how you do it. I mean, it, it probably goes along with most things in a call center, but but what you don't measure, you can't improve. So um, we think a lot about what types of data are you getting from your training regimen. If you think about that life cycle of learn, practice, perform. As a call center, what are you tracking along those milestones to help you understand, is my training actually getting the results that I want? So um, it goes beyond just are our uh, call center reps completing the training that we've required? I think that's maybe a level you could look at, but more so what areas of the training are we not comprehending? What areas of the training do we find that, our call center reps continue to go back and revisit what areas of practice, if we're asking them to practice, are they, you know, struggling with or excelling at? 
uh, because all of that ultimately will help you build a better program over time as you think about the next rep that comes into the business or if you think about the next training campaign that you need to run. All of that data ultimately helps you understand, am I doing the right things and is it actually getting me results? Good points. Good points. Okay. Well, uh, we I know we have some questions here, so I'd like to turn things over to uh, Alan to to give you the first question. Alan? Hi. Uh, yeah, we have a couple questions here. This question is from Henry. We haven't gone down this path yet. What are the first steps in moving towards the model you talk about? Yeah, that that's a that's a good question from Henry. I, I think our suggestion always um, would be essentially uh, we, we call it a learning action plan. Um, but essentially, think about before you really start down any of this, it, it really um, is advantageous to think about uh, a couple of things. So first is your onboarding path. Do you have that well documented? Do you um, really understand the things that an agent needs to know in order to perform, uh, you know, in a short amount of time so that they can get productive for you? The second part is really looking at your model um, customer support agents. So who are the best in your support group? And what are the kind of attributes, characteristics, knowledge? What do they have? And kind of use that as a model for what you want to drive all the other training towards. So uh, what are the skills they have? What um, processes are they really good at following? Um, What are the uh, kind of knowledge uh, areas that they're super strong at? And when you start to like really map out both on, on onboarding and ongoing areas that you need to be developing, then you can start to tick off, here's the things and the trainings that I need to go really focus on and build that are actually going to move the needle. I think the mistake we see a lot of people making is diving into, you know, technology, diving into action before they really start with a good plan. So I would suggest kind of that we call it a learning action plan before you dive into anything else. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, too many people do kind of, uh, because it's so busy in the call center, sort of react rather than uh, act in an uh, organized fashion. And by using the planning approach, planning methodology, I think Henry can uh, probably get a lot of benefit for his uh, call center. And let's keep in mind, too, that right now we're in uh, budget season. So this is the time to think about what is it we're going to be doing for next year. Uh, what is it we're going to be uh, planning, and uh, how are we going to be funding that planning, et cetera? And you know, uh, one of the nice things is is that uh, any CEO, any CFO, et cetera, understands that training is part of any operation. So they may have not a clue what really goes on in the contact center, which unfortunately is all too often the case. But if there's a request for training, or things relating to training, that will be acceptable and they'll understand that because training is something that happens all over the enterprise, right? So uh, anyway, that's another little thought for our listeners. Um, Yeah, I know we have another question. Uh, Alan? Yes, our next question is from Candy. She says, our agents seem very happy when they finish training, but their satisfaction goes down when they move to the phone. Any ideas? Um, yeah, I think I've got a few there. Um, you know, first of all, good job making sure, you know, folks are coming out of training, feeling ready to go. Um, definitely a hurdle to get over. Um, I I honestly, I I bet the core kind of problem you're dealing with there relates to what I talked about earlier around thinking of training as just onboarding. So if you get into a cadence, we see some of our best kind of customers and partners in the industry, a, a cadence where after that initial onboarding, they're getting weekly lessons or trainings delivered to them, um, ultimately makes them continue to feel, uh, you know, confident on the phones, continue to feel like you're investing in them. So I guess without knowing a whole lot, I would say look at your ongoing training regimen and what does it include would be the first suggestion. Uh, the second thing would be, Again, keep in mind, I don't know how long the onboarding process is for you, um, but keep in mind that 70% of that is going to be lost. So what are you doing to reinforce some of the concepts that you introduce to the agents out of the gate? 
um, I think is really important to consider. So there's certain things where you want to look at, you know, a week after their initial onboarding, um, what are the things we could drip to them that are quick reminders, simple assessments, um, simple practice scenarios that really allow them to not only uh, recall information, but to practice the information that they've been, you know, trained on. Um, and, and then also gives you a gauge of how well is that sticking over time because, you know, repeated retrieval and practice is what is going to yield retention um, and, and probably the reason they're feeling uh, less satisfied as you go on. Yeah, and re- retention here uh, kind of really is both their retention of the material and ultimately your retention of them because if they feel supported and they feel that they can give good customer service, they're likely to be more satisfied and stay with you. Than if, if you not. nailed it. So, yeah. Yeah, and and actually, while uh, you know, I was listening to Candy's question from Alan, and your response, I just pulled up a copy of our Agent Voices report that we did, and this was based on over 5,000 agent surveys, and one of the things that came out of that was uh, under the training and promotions category was, un- uh, for the question, our initial training program prepared me well for my position. Over 50% said they strongly agreed. That's extraordinary. That's uh, yeah. among all of the, the data we got, that was extraordinary. And the net score, which was, you know, taking the top two and just uh, taking away the, the lowest two, was uh, probably the highest that we got for any question. However, then you go to the next question, which is I felt, felt supported during the transition from the initial training environment to doing my job independently, and it falls off precipitously. I mean, really, mm. it goes down to a... Uh, uh, a much lower from uh, over fi- just over 50% goes down to 27.2% for strongly agree under that. So wow. uh, I think this, uh, that really supports what you were saying and what we're talking about here, and that is that um, the initial training needs to be properly supported, needs to be properly tracked and, uh, you know, continued through the process. And uh, we can see that you know uh, it has uh, that, that not doing that has an impact on on agent satisfaction. Yeah. So. Okay. Good. Well, I know we're getting to the end of the hour, but Alan, do we have time for one more question? I believe we do. We have one from Tommaso. He says, "Our company is in the consumer electronics. Do you, or Bruce, have any example from the consumer product industry you could share with us?" Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I can start, Bruce. You can pile onto this one. I, I would say, without naming names, we work with a uh, a large telecommunications company, and the you know kind of has a bunch of call centers supporting cell phone devices, um, and has retail stores that also support those. And I think, you know, actually it relates to Candy's question. The the biggest thing that they've done is they've built a cadence, really of We've got about 6,500 folks across their call center and their their retail stores. And what they're really uh, pushing to the stores literally every week is a 10-minute lesson on the latest thing they need to know. So that can be a process change. That can be a, um, you know, uh, a new device that's coming out, a new product that's being released. It can be a new promotion, a new bundling. Um, All of those things together – is really what is, is driving the results. And when they look across those 6,500 reps, they're seeing increased CSAT scores. They're seeing folks say, hey, the, the culture and the investment you're making in me as an agent is, is really appreciated. So I think, you know, honestly, it really boils down to that cadence and delivery format of the ongoing training that they're providing. In an old world, it was very drab. It was pull them off the floor and pull them in a classroom. In the new world, it is a 10 minute lesson they can go do on their own and then they can interact with their manager about questions they have. And I think that shift is, has made a big impact for them um, is one example that comes to mind. Mm. Yeah, no, a very good one. And uh, yeah, we've had quite a bit of experience in this area and uh, it's getting more and more difficult because of the blistering pace of changes in products. Uh, so if you're with consumer electronics, you're dealing with all those uh, things that mm-hmm. keep on morphing, and uh, yet you've still got a bunch of legacy things coming on. So you have the challenge of uh, making sure that the people who have been with you for a while keep up with all the new stuff, but then you actually have to back-train people who come on board to some of the older stuff as well. 
and um, you know having uh, proper routing, workforce management, all that kind of thing, uh, workforce optimization, so that you get those questions answered, uh, Tommaso, on a um, uh, a proper basis is uh, definitely a challenge, but something that can be done through a number of things. One is making sure that you have a really good uh, connection and cooperation between your product people and your training people and your supervisors and making sure that, in fact, the supervisors are kept up to date as well as the agents. Uh, the agents will start losing respect for supervisors who don't know their stuff and uh, who they can't actually uh, you know, count on for some help. Uh, the other thing is uh, thinking in terms of um, supporting people both through training and through expert hubs. So uh, making sure that uh, people are able to, uh, you know, push something up the line when they have to do that, escalate uh, to people who really know something, but then trying to make sure that whatever is the uh, expertise that they don't have, that they can, in fact, get that. And then one final thing I'd say is that the loop here needs to be uh, good, too, because if the frontline people see that something's not working well or that there isn't good uh, you know, communication. They need to be able to loop that back and have a responsive organization come up with the training that they need uh, so that they can, in fact, do a good job going forward. Um, tying incentives into all this is something that I've seen done very successfully as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a whole other uh, call talk episode, but, you know, uh, definitely a fun one to think about. So, uh, yeah, that's it, uh, I'd say, on that one. And I know we've kind of come to the end of our time here, but I'd like to give uh, Connor an opportunity to, uh, well, first of all, to thank our, our listeners uh, for listening and to thank uh, Henry Candy and Tommaso for your questions. And, uh, Connor, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we uh, send things back to Alan to wrap things up? No, no. Appreciate everyone's uh, time and attention and questions and uh, hopefully cover some useful ground. Uh, if you need any more tips or pointers or just best practices, I'd point you to, to lessonly.com. Our, our team does a great job just keeping a library of helpful resources around building great training plans and running a great training regimen in your call center. So I'd point you there if you're interested in, in going a little more in depth. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your input. Uh, great show. And uh, over to Alan. Thanks again, Connor and Bruce, for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show, or look at our huge collection of archived shows on, a, on various topics at BenchmarkPortal.com. Then click on Call Talk, where you'll find over seven seasons of this show. From all of us here at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockhutter signing out. Have a great day.